following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. I am back, and you are Comfortably Zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, and across the moat from Oakland in the northern part of the great state of California. Um, uh, Happy to talk to you all, and as usual, because it is my want to talk to some of the most interesting people on the planet on a regular basis. Um, I have a guest, and he is that. He's a returning guest, and he is among the most interesting of the interesting. He is Jack O'Hallorhan. How are you, Jack? I'm very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Yeah, I uh, we didn't connect a few times, and it's been a while since you've been here. I want a little bit of an update on uh, what you're doing. You're putting together a film of your book. Am, am I? Yeah, we're pretty something? close now. It's coming together very well. Okay, is it a documentary or a movie? Oh no, it's a movie. Okay, and. Uh, so I'll be starring as Meyer Lansky, am I correct? Good idea. Just you shave your beard and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> if that's a hey, casting you gotta, call, you gotta, if that's a casting call, I can play. I could probably play Maya Lansky's mother. <laughs> yeah. Maya, Maya, what the, Maya, you go to, can't you play baseball with the kids? <laughs> what, what's going on? Are you going to be a doctor, Maya? Um, how's that? That's not bad there, Sonny Boy. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, did you ever know Maya Lansky's mother, just out of curiosity, <laughs> probably? Uh, nobody, I mean, they, her, his parents died over in Europe. Oh, really? Okay. I make a joke of of that. Uh, I'm sure they were Holocaust survivors or non-survivors. Am I correct? He actually was um, raised in, he's actually from Poland, which was part of Russia at the time. He um, had a very eclectic background. It was amazing. He came to America when he was about, I guess he was around 13 years old. Oh, Oh, wow. Wow. Um, one of your, uh, you told a great story last time you were on about Maya Lansky. I won't ask you to repeat it, but uh, quite a character was he. Tell me about the movie and um, what stage of production. The movie's really doing well. We're, we're in the process now of finishing the financial raise, and uh, it looks exceedingly promising that uh, – it's going to come down the way I uh, I wanted I want to do it, and uh, you know, it's uh, because it, <clears throat> we don't want to lose control of the film. We want to make sure that we you know that goes on the screen what we want on the screen, mm-hmm. and uh, it appears that all that's going to happen. So I'm not giving control to a studio. In other words, I'm not just signing it over to a studio and letting them make what they want. <clears throat> We're going to do the film on independent financing, and then. We'll uh, do the distribution deal ourselves, and, uh, oh, wow. and it'll work That's a, very well. That's a big undertaking. I'm sure you have um, people who are you're partnered with because you're p- pretty much on the creative end. Am I correct? Well, actually, both sides. I, I had a great teacher in a, in a man called Elliot Kastner, who was probably one of the most prolific producers years ago and he, I did my first picture Farewell My Lovely with him and and my second March or Die and he did more pictures with Brando than anybody and he had a, a unique old school formula for doing movies and that works and it works well because uh, you don't need a, a whole pool of investors or pre-selling stuff off and everything there's a very simple formula for doing a film and, and controlling it and making sure that it's done properly and Everybody gets paid properly, and uh, so that's where we've, we've stuck to that, and we're, we've gotten it pretty much down the street right now, and some of the investors are very happy because mostly they, 
they scurry to get their money back, and, and with the theory that we have, they won't have to do that. And everybody thinks that the movie will be a blockbuster, which I know it will be. So, Okay. You know, I just put two and two and two together, and I realize why you've been successful in every facet of your life. Here's what it is. And you, we've talked enough that I've gotten little bits and pieces of how how you've done as a football player, as a boxer, as a, an actor, now as a producer. You take mentoring well. You always attribute your success to what you learn from others. And... You, d you don't try to reinvent the wheel. You got a good trainer who taught you how to box. You got a good producer now, I'm thinking. You got people to, that mentored you. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I learned from my am I right? You, am I right? You, you soaked no, no, up in the money. information. Meyer Lansky taught me when I was a kid, you know, you learn more by listening than you do by talking. And uh, and I learned how to listen when I was young, and, and I learned all through my life that if you listen to people who do things well and you extract a formula from what they do and you and you implant it in what you're going to do, then your uh, success rate is, is quite good, you know. Wow. You know, um, that in itself can be an, an instru uninstructional to people coming up in any facet of life, anything they're doing, that uh, that information is gold. So um, I'm happy Very to pass that People on. ever, ever learn how to listen. They all want to over-talk, bam, 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 and put their, their theories out. And they very rarely learn to listen to what's being said and to, you know, shortcome all the nonsense. Right. It's a... Uh, you know, it's it's just a it's a habit I got in when I was very young, and I'm glad that he uh, that it was put in my in my life that way. You know. Yeah. Oh, I wonder who it was that passed that on to you. Well, it was a combination of Lansky and Frank Costello, wow. and and a guy named Rip Collins uh, had me when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. It, to me, I'm just. It's just, in a way, it's kind of amusing. I'm talking, who was it to pass out? Meyer Lansky and what was Costello? I can't even think of Costello's name. Frank, um, Frank, was a, Frank Costello was a, was a bright, yeah. bright guy. Yeah. Well, um, you, if I remember correctly, you credit your dad with being very bright. You credit oh, yeah. Meyer Lansky with being very bright. Um uh you can't teach that. You can't coach that, can you? Just like speed, oh. you can't. You can't coach how fast a guy is going to run, how fast a guy is going to react. And well, you take it. You look at a guy like Meyer Lansky. He was the accountant, and he was probably the smartest businessman I ever met. And he never wrote anything down. All in his head. Yeah. And, and I and I and I used to ask him, you know, why? He said, "Listen, the formula to doing anything in business is simplicity. Just keep it simple. You have a product, you have a column here, a column there, and a column there, and the, and the end column has to add up. If it doesn't, somebody in the middle is taking something they shouldn't be taking. <laughs> he, I mean, yeah. he, he could he could zero in on things so unbelievable. It was a you know, and he kept, because it was all simplicity, he kept it simple. And, and here's a man who was a major shareholder in some of the biggest insurance companies in the country, some of the major corporations in the country. I mean, he invested a lot of money in a lot of clever ways. And, uh, and, and the guy never did any time in jail, pal, you know. He tried, but... Uh, that's, that's something always, to think about. Yeah. Um, <sighs> wow. How did he pass? Did he he pass naturally, or? Um... Uh, he just he got ill, and he, he was old, and you know he just passed away. Oh, okay. It wasn't anything violent or, or anything. Oh no. 
And there's a guy, there's a guy with like five foot two, and he used to walk around, walking in his dogs, you know, around Miami by himself. Nobody, I mean, he didn't need 20 bodyguards, or he had a driver who was always not too far from him, but Meyer, um, Meyer, Meyer, Meyer had a look. He could look at you and make you wet your pants, man. He tells a story about it, his communique with the head of an insurance company in Philadelphia. That uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> priceless. Uh, um, to say nothing about his, he had the idea of having you sit there as a reminder. Uh, what, 6'6", uh, 6'8"? Six, 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 <laughs> yeah, 6'6". Six, six. He did that a few times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Other times, be, besides the Philadelphia um, CEO of an insurance company, huh? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Are you just do you have any you, funny memories? Anything that went down that was absolutely funny? Yeah, the way I used to meet him in Florida, I, used to, you know, I would get a phone call, and they would tell me to uh, <clears throat> walk on the beach in front of the Fountain Blue, going south and just walk down that beach at a certain time of the day and, and and somebody would be kicking sand on my leg behind me and it was him and he'd be talking to me while we were walking because he didn't want people photographing us standing together or sitting together so I'd be walking down the beach and he'd be yappy 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 talking to me teaching me certain <laughs> things while we walked you know? and, I, and I always said to him well it's kind of a peculiar way to correspond with people we said listen Safety of you is more important than a lot of things, kid. And you're going to learn that as you get older. You know, he said, that just you don't give, don't give anybody an edge on yourself. Got you. Got you. No. So you uh, wow. learn where to place yourself, and you know, you don't hang out on corners and say I'm part of this gang or that gang, and you know, get yourself affiliated to where. So many stories can be told that are not true and are true, and you know, uh, it's how people go to jail for 30, 40 years because of who said this and who said that, and, and swearing that you were standing in a place that you did this and that, and you know. So I was all over the place. I was in Boston, and New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia. You know, nobody, nobody you could ever manage to stand out. I'm sure. So that had to had to be. Um a factor that, with what you did. In other words, you're easily recognizable. Yeah, it's amazing how a guy my size learned how to melt into the crowd. <laughs> right, that's what I mean. That's. Um, but I'll tell you, a guy your size, everybody out there listening, and if this is the first time you're listening to Jack on these airwaves, my audi I want you to make note of the fact that Jack was a uh, not only a former professional football player an actor he was a heavyweight contender who fought Foreman Norton almost fought Ali fought Ali's brother as a matter of fact and if you go to YouTube and watch him it, he's the biggest guy other than Ali, and you were bigger than Ali, you could move in the ring. You, uh, and you move your you. head. Um, you were a boxer, not a, um, what, what's the expression? Uh, a boxer, not a, a what? A boxer puncher. I, you know, I just, I could, I could. I was a boxer puncher. I could move. I could box. You know, I. Yeah. Uh, but not I, just a puncher. In other words, not not just the guy who's there, like and waiting or walking in and stuff like that. No. Yeah, you can move and um, terrific athlete. Um, I I really admire that. I admire the the fact that you could do so many things. Like, I walk and chew gum, and I'm giving myself a standing ovation and in my head. Um, so I appreciate what you do. Let me tell you what you've done. Ah, here's the question I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Basically, you're involved in writing 
your memoirs. I mean, it's story of your family, this, that, and the other thing, and you you got books coming and stuff. How do you edit? You have these great stories and these great memories. How do how do you go about writing, determining what goes in in the works, what stays out? Um, I'm just I'm just curious, try to get get an idea of how it's done. I have a um, I have a great uh, ghostwriter that works with me, and in fact, he, I've changed his whole life around. He's an English guy, but a very good writer, and uh, and I've opened his eyes to things in the world that just totally mesmerize him. He just blows him away, you know. But he, I talk and he writes, you know, and then I look at what he writes and I correct it, and uh, uh, and he, um, but I I have sent this guy to libraries to look up things and told him where to find them. And, uh, and I sent him to Dallas, and he was at the Bird Building, and he did the walk from the Bird Building to uh, where Oswald supposedly went all through that whole deal. And, and he, he just was, he couldn't believe the reality of things that were there that nobody ever talked about. And the fact that it was the time frame of doing things that made it impossible to be, as many places as you're supposed to be. And I sent him to New Orleans, and, and I introduced him to some people, and 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 he would, uh, we would meet in London a lot because he lived in England. And so I'd, I'd meet him in London a lot and be in restaurants, and everybody, you know, was very respectful to me. He gave me the best tables, and nobody ever gave me a check. And he said, why do these people all know you so well? And I said, well, just, you know, it's just uh, – a manner of living, you know, and he, he said, it's incredible. these are serious people that people are scared to death of, and, and here they are coming paying homage to you, and I said, it's an homage, it's respect, you know, because uh, yeah. I have a lot of friends in, in every country of the world, I've been everywhere, and, you know, it's just, I was one, I learned how to go face to face and meet people, and make your presence known, and, uh, and uh, it's the only way I know how to do business. You know, i got to sit with you face-to-face or we don't do anything, you know. Okay, Jack, um, when we first started talking, we talked about um, your revealing some of the stuff that you reveal, and was there ever a, uh, an idea in your mind that there are people that are still angry about this, that, or the other thing, and maybe not wanting you to reveal this, that, or the other thing. And uh, you assured me, you just, uh, just the way you said it, Cavalier, oh, all the people are dead, uh, this, you know, no problems. Uh, everybody's at peace. It's all legit. This week, um, I uh, sent you uh, forwarded you a link to a story that I read that um, had a Gambino um, uh, uh, crime person, I don't know how you say it, Uh, my grandmother is a hoodlum, but he got uh, bumped off in the Bronx. uh, did you know him? Did you know Gambino? He got shot in Staten Island. He got killed in Staten Island. He, he was, Staten uh, or Staten I'm sorry. Frank, Frank was from Sicily. He was a good guy. He was a nice guy. He was, a, he, he was, he was like an old school guy because he was low key. He didn't flaunt himself around like John did and, and a couple other people. Um, problem is he, he lived in a high end area of Staten Island and, uh, they, Certain things are, are, are there's certain things that people do and certain people you shouldn't do. There are certain rules that you follow and certain rules you shouldn't break. And uh, you know sometimes when people do things that they feel that they have achieved a certain power that they can do it their way, um, it doesn't work out so well. You know, and uh, I think that uh, you know what happened to Frank was. People four months ago knew it was going to happen. You know, it was just a matter of time. Yeah, because he was a nice guy, he wasn't a bad guy at all, and he just 
you know, people just uh, sometimes take things upon themselves to to do things their way and uh, without sitting down and talking to the proper group of people that you should talk to. So it's it's a matter of uh, of respecting uh, a way of life, and unfortunately, that's been the problem throughout the country with uh, with several people. You know, when they say that it's the first time anybody's been whacked in 35 years, that's 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 foolish statement. That's a very foolish statement, but um, because it's untrue. You just there are some people that were whacked that you just don't they don't publicize and. Uh, this kid, they publicize for a reason, and uh, you know, it all comes yeah. out at the end of the day. Yeah, I certainly don't want to know the reason. <laughs> but, right, I'm sure the world itself is on an um, you know it when you need to know it basis. And I'm I mean, that's the way that's the way the world works, isn't it? You know, you just uh, you know, it's like I said. Listen, when you when you get involved in a certain way of life, there are a set of rules, like anything else that you do in your life, you know. And if you don't want to abide by those rules, then don't play the game. Don't get involved. Mm-hmm. That's what my father was notorious for saying to people, you know. People used to say, well, why don't you give him a second chance? And, why don't you? and Albert would say, why? If, if you know the name of the game and you know the rules, why would you turn around blatantly break them and then come to me and ask me to forgive you and give you a second chance, which shows weakness upon my part on you because I'm not abiding by all the rules and I'm giving you exception to the rule, and you'll turn around and you'll be a rat on me in 10 years because you think I'm weak. So we don't play that game. And the, that's why people say, oh boy, he was so, uh, the mad hatter, you know, he whacked a lot of people and stuff. He just, he, they never, it was all amongst themselves. If you, like I said, if you join, if you join a team and you know there's a set of rules in a game, then you play by the rules. If you, if you break the rules, you know what the infraction costs you for breaking that particular rule. And if it yeah. means you're putting your life on the line, then so be it. If you think you're, if you think that you're uh, bad enough or, or, or clever enough to outwit people that put these rules down and then mock them by breaking them in front of their face, then you deserve what you get. Mm. And I believe that today, you know. Yeah. I, yeah I, sometimes I talk to you, I feel like I'm in a Mario Puzo movie and we're just chatting on the phone and the clicks you hear is not the, is not the chi man. <laughs> I, I just get that in my head. Um, can you tie anything um, to Trump to make me uh, feel a little better? That Trump is doing a lot of great for this country. You look at what he's done foreign policy-wise, and he has put the fear of God back in people where it belongs to be. You know, too many years we've we bowed down to different countries and stuff when we should never have done that. And Trump doesn't do that. He stands up for the country of America, and he will not tolerate anyone abusing it. And and, and that's all going to come to light, you know. All this stuff about who's a liar, this guy and that guy, and this guy went to jail. And, you know, that guy's whole career was bent around extorting things. It wasn't just when he got involved with Trump. It was way before that. His whole life was that way. And Cohen was a liar from the day one as well. So these guys manipulated, siphoned off money, did things. They were doing that all their lives. Now, the foolishness is that, unfortunately, Donald didn't have someone telling him how, how, how devious these people were because they had a great front story. That's how they advanced in their political careers. You know, they always uh, kept de- it behind the curtain. How devious cut. was Donald Trump? I think it, again? it all starts at the top, don't you? You think you think that he knew about everything those guys were doing? Oh, I don't think he. Uh, my impression a of clue. a person like Donald Trump, who is a mega, a micromanaging uh, cuckoo from from the world. In other words, he knew everything that was going on in every part of 
his, his this campaign, the business, the foundations, the Trump Institute, the Trump Towers. He knows Russian. he knows what he sees himself and what he himself thinks he controls. Okay, and people spin a yarn about doing this and being able to maneuver and do things, and he watched people maneuver and do things, and, and they seem to be doing it with the grace of, of everyone around them, where people enjoined and said, oh, yeah, this guy's a great guy. I've known him for years, blah, 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 blah. And it didn't come out until Donald really started looking under the covers and saw this and that and said, whoa, you're not getting me involved in this junk. That ain't happening. And the exposures came. And they tried to they tried to fit him up with Russia, and they tried to fit him up with it. I mean, this guy Cohen had the audacity just lately to turn around and say, "Donald owes me a fortune for legal work that I did." You know, and that's the most ludicrous thing because he has receipts of paying this guy for everything he ever did legally. But this guy, these people siphon money from other areas other than the, uh, being around Trump. They use their power in a very innocuous way. And, and and there's people that do that all day long in, as CEOs of corporations and don't get caught until further down the street. And they're doing it right in front of the board, and the board doesn't see it because they want to believe this guy is a, a miracle worker. You understand? Should Cohen, be, should Cohen be worried about his life? I wouldn't want to be eating breakfast with him. Okay. That, see, that's the first thing that came to my mind. But I don't think that, that, I don't think that that would ever come from Donald. Donald's not that type of person. Oh that no, it wouldn't come from else. From, it did. wouldn't come from him. It would come from a wink and a nod. Well, there's a mean? lot of people that this guy hurt, and it's all coming out. You know, and here he is crying for the, his family, and what am I going to do with my family? But he wasn't thinking about his family when he was robbing people of a lot of money. You're talking millions of dollars. You're not talking chump change here. You're talking no, about are you ta- an old, I, I old meant, period of time. And this I guy think, lied no, to everybody. He, he even lied to the congressional committee when they when they cut him a deal. And he was going to, he said, well, I'll that, cooperate. And he lied when he I, cooperated. I think he, I, I said Cohen, not Manafort. Should Cohen Manafort be, and Cohen both the same. Okay. They both lied through their teeth. They both were offered deals that they were supposed to do this and supposed to do that, and they were going to cooperate. And in the cooperation, they told bold, barefaced lies. And they invented stories that they thought that the people around them were going to collaborate because they always did, because they were all stealing money. But now they see that their own fingers are going to get burned. They backed away. And he got left standing in the rain by himself. Okay. How do you see the end game going in the Trump thing? Will he be reelected? Will he be indicted? Just nobody knows for sure, but... I think that that Donald will get reelected. Let me tell you that. If he runs again, I think he'll get reelected. I think it's going to surface in the next year the things that he's doing for this country that are positive. He's creating a lot of jobs. He's bringing an industry back into the country. He's 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 well, put our he's put our, our our strength in foreign nations back in place, and he's doing it with he's standing right up in front of them. And, and, and they're not, I am not doing this. You are not abusing my country anymore. You're not. He just he he you know, the guy in Korea was bullying everybody for a long time. You're not bullying Donald Trump. So Trump's. if I use the expression Putin's bitch. On you, for him, not you. You being Putin's bitch, I wouldn't think you were in anyone's bitch, young man. But um, if I, I use the expression Donald Trump is a Putin's bitch, that's would not true. You totally so deny far from that true. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Pardon me. That is so far from true. It's ridiculous. That's not true at all. Now you got to go back. You know, get, you're a smart guy. Where did Putin come from? Where did Putin come from? What did he do before he was the head of Russia? Where did he He come from? He was the head of their spy. He was uh, their secret service or whatever. Where did he come from before that? Um, 
He's a gangster. Uh, He's been a, a gangster all his life. <laughs> he was a, a tailor. His father was a tailor. His mother yeah, right. took that him on. Guy. I'm telling you right now, the man was a gangster. He's been a gangster all his life, and he's still a gangster. Okay? But oh. he's a powerful oh. guy over there. But he, he doesn't, he doesn't, how much money has Putin siphoned out of Russia himself? Probably billions of dollars. Come on, man. I mean, you know, people make me laugh. And they, 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 they put this guy like he's the all-powerful authority. That's a bunch of crap. I, listen, we, had, we used to own gaming in Russia until Putin came in, and he nationalized it. We had brand-new casinos that were just about to be open that were closed the day they were supposed to open. Okay. Uh, understand? Were you guys on good terms with him? Well, yeah, because everybody was gangsters, man. <laughs> it was, a, it was a. Oh. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. They, when they first came into New York, they bought all the cab companies they could get their hands on anywhere dealing with cash. You understand? We right. sold them uh, Apple limousine out of Brooklyn, and but anyway, I'm doing a movie out in Hollywood. And I get a phone call from some friends in New York, and they say, you got to come home. I said, well, for what? you got to come home and sit down. Please come back here and help us straighten something out. So they had the Russians had this office in Long Island, and they wanted the, 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 the biggest uh, game that they do in Russia. They play cards. That's, that's their biggest entertainment. Yeah? So they wanted to do a deal with card company cycle you know bicycle belonged to us and so they wanted to do a deal for getting uh, containers of cards to send back to russia well, i i came back and i sat down with these guys and, and and i'm sitting talking to a guy and he's got like 10 post gorillas standing behind him and uh and he's saying well you know we we want to we we would like to take a boatloads boatloads of cards back to russia we'd like to get a very good deal put together I said, not a problem. Here's the deal. I'll get the deal done at Bicycle. The cards will be put on the dock here. When they get on the dock, you pay for them. Well, we thought we would get them and put them on a ship and, and, uh, and, and take them back to Russia and pay, to, pay for it when they got to Russia. And I looked at this guy and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you know who I am? You know where I come from? He said, oh, positively, that's why we're having this meeting. I said, well, here's the deal. Don't insult my intelligence, okay? Don't give me that look like you want. I said, you're looking to buy some piece of junk boat, take them halfway back, sink the boat, take the cards off, and tell us they were lost, and we don't see no money or nothing? Do I look like I fell off a turnip truck somewhere? And you see those goons behind you? You lie to me one time or don't do this thing the way it should be done, I'll put you all in the matchbox and send you home. Now, you want to play, let's play. If you want to do business, let's do business. But this is not a game we're doing here. We'll put the cards on the dock. You pay for them when they get there, and they belong to you. You get them to rush any way you want. I don't care if you carry them over or water surf them. Don't matter no difference to me. You own them right here in New York. In New York. When those cards come from, when they, when they come here, they belong to you. You pay for them. That's all. We'll make you a great deal if you want to, if you, if you want to do that, absolute. If not, what am I wasting my time for? Do you think that your, your gorillas there are going to entice somebody to make us do a deal that we're not going to do? You've got to be joking. You're in my backyard, champ. This isn't Russia. This is America. Understand? Wow. And that's when we did a deal with bicycle. With bicycle made cards, and they, 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 they made the best cards out there. And so they, they bought up. They bought boatloads of cards. They took them back to Russia. It was a score for everybody. It was all good. It was a nice deal. It worked out fine. And the guy came up to me. Guy came up to me a week later. We had dinner in, in New York, and he he came up to me and he said, "You know, I I I, I gotta say that I have to respect you." I said, "It is about respect. You're scared to death of me, pal, and I want you to stay that way." <laughs> okay. Because you think you're so walk in our country you, and shoot you told me once, Jack, that Trump had to deal with you guys 
as everybody did as a New York construction person. No, everybody. His father. His father was well. How do you think his father got as much money as he got? But that doesn't make him a bad guy. No, I didn't say. No, I'm not. Anything I say is non-accusatory. I just want clarity. What that never leaves you. That never le- If I'm Donald Trump and and my father got help from you guys, and I got help from you guys in private business. You don't just turn that off when you become. Well, what, what does that mean? What, what what is it supposed to do to you? Is it supposed to give you black eyes? Is it supposed to give you stains on your clothes? What is it supposed no. to do to you? It's not supposed to do anything to you. But I have to assume, that, you know, my logical conclusion is that he's still dealing with you guys, and that's not yours as. Um, I'll tell you something. Any, any is, other uh, organization, yeah. as the heads of the church, as the heads of baseball, as the heads of any corporation, the drug companies especially, um, you guys are, uh, you have a certain motto of trustworthiness that I can, I see that clearly. So I just wonder if you could connect the dot, the dots, and confirm what I think. I think um, you guys, when I say you guys, or, uh, you probably do business with Trump. Am I correct? Well, On you, some you, levels. It, you know, it, it's not like a, like a, like a sit-down or something that you're, you're doing this or doing that. Everybody crosses paths in their lives. Okay. People cross paths in different manners. You, 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 you're here, you're there, you're crossing paths. Uh, people well, Mike, this. the path I'm trying to connect is the Russian the thing, well, here's connection the thing I with Trump. Trump. Did Trump have a Russian? Co- did he collude? In your opinion, no. Did he he collude with Russia? Did they help no. him with the WikiLeaks? Uh, WikiLeaks leaks or whatever the hell it's called, and the emails and all that stuff. Did Trump do, or did he? Was he smart enough? got to give him credit for that, to have Manafort deal with these people, Cone deal with these people. Everybody who's gone to jail, they dealt with him. Um, That's because you're not listening. You don't understand something. These guys that were doing these deals in different places were doing side deals of their own. But they were doing deals, and Manafort was in Russia. Am I correct? Say it again. Manafort was in Russia, doing business in Russia. Yeah, he was doing deals on his own. He had his own little scams going over there. Yeah. Okay. But nevertheless, at the time, he was the campaign director of Trump's fund. That didn't stop him from doing his ancillary deals that he did everywhere in his life. That didn't stop him from that. He only used the popularity of being his campaign manager to allow him to do more things than he could do before because of popularity, because, oh, my God, this guy must be really sincere and legit and all this other jazz, you know. Okay, but do you expect, do you think, or do you believe that Trump had no knowledge of it given that he was his campaign manager and that they talked on a pretty regular basis. He was trying to put in tr- a Trump Tower with, with Ivanka and all, all that stuff. He probably had a pretty close feelings with with the Russians. Would you say he he personally knew about what was going on, or would you say that could have been a wink and a nod thing? question. Jack, did I lose you? Okay. I hope you didn't hang up on me because I asked a stupid question. But um, I've been hung up on in life for asking stupid questions. Uh, Jack, I'm going to um, take a little break and see if we can't get you back. 
And this is the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And if uh, we get you back, we get you back. Otherwise, we've talked enough in your in your mind, um, certainly. Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, I'm Ralph Tycho. You are Comfortably Zoned with the Zigzag Man. Jack O'Halloran talked to us a long time. We lost him. I'm going to push the button and pause it. If not, we'll catch you down the line. I'm back with Jack. He did, uh, didn't hang up, didn't think I asked a stupid question, and uh, just uh, we had a phone problem. So now if you would, Jack, answer the question. If, you, if you're there, doing business with someone, okay, let's, let's, let's yeah. take yourself. And you're doing business with uh, with a, a station or or people that you you're hooking up these this podcast with, yeah. And you know them for ten years, and you're you're doing business with them every day, and, and you eat with them, and you go out with them, and you think you know them personally well. And then you one day you wake up and you find out the guy was a serial killer for the last ten years. You think yeah. that's never happened in life? Sure, it has. People been surprised, like that guy. Oh my God! There's, there's people that I, I know. People that, that that went to church with people. The guy was involved in the, in, in the in the in the church. He was involved in their neighborhood. Nicest guy in the world, and he found that he's the biggest accountant swindler that there is walking down the street. And he's been doing it for years, and no one ever until they caught him. Well, that happens with every walk of life. And you've got to understand something. Donald is, is, is a man who is only two men in the country, the history of America, two guys that ever became president without owing a dime to anyone or owing a favor to anyone. And he certainly owed no favors to Putin to become president, let me tell you. Never owed a favor and didn't owe a dime to anybody. And you got to give him stand up across, and then he stands up and he and he defends the country everywhere across the board. And maybe he's a little bit too liberal with his tweeter. Yep, I agree with that. But that's just his personality. What you can't do, you, are you going to turn around and tell me that 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 Jack Jack Kennedy was working with Khrushchev, didn't do deals in Russia? But it wasn't Jack Kennedy who did the deals. It was his father. So there's always a lion somewhere in the background. Jack so Kennedy. Was that, was that standoff uh, destined to turn out for the good and they knew it? What standoff? The standoff where he and Bobby we're going to turn back um, some boats in Cuba. You know. Do you know how much money Joe Kennedy put into Cuba? You have no idea, do you? Do you know how much of a big supporter he was of, of Fidel Castro's? Do you know how much? Oh. Let me say something to you. In the Bay of Pigs, and I had friends of mine died there that day. And he told his son that those soldiers didn't need any bullets in their guns. He didn't want any excuse, any anything to go off and, and cause a, a ruckus because somebody fired a gun out of out of misplacement, and they all got slaughtered. Did you they hear what I just that said? On they blame that on miscommunication with Eisenhower. Can you remember Wrong. that? Wrong. Wrong. They blamed it on whoever they could blame it on, but they never came up with factual proof to prove it, did they? Uh, nothing that didn't make ah. the biggest blot on his his political life. <laughs> oh my God! I can't believe you're you're that naive that you do not understand that there's two sides to every story. No, I un I'm not arguing, but that goes as a blight, not a blot, on on his political I, life. Eisenhower had nothing to do with it. Oh, 
Eisenhower was doing, Eisenhower followed instructions and did what he was told to do. He was a military man. You can't, you know, there are, there are, there are deals. What? Who was putting out the orders to Eisenhower, the president of, of the United States and the, um, at that time, were you guys putting out the orders to him? We, you think that we would have stood there and watched those people be slaughtered in that in the Bay of Pigs? We had friends of ours died there. Huh. Yeah. No one realizes how many double dealings Joseph Kennedy did in in life. That's why he had so many enemies. This is new to me. Um, I've always known about him turning back boats that, uh, with refugees and, um, and all that. I always knew he was a friend of Hitler on some level, as was Prescott Bush, to the best of my knowledge, and, and others. A friend, a friend of Hitler? Let me tell you something. Only when it came to making money. Joe Kennedy did anything he could do that made money. When he went to Europe to become the ambassador to England, he was told by certain people, we want you to introduce you to some friends of ours over in, in, the, in the theaters over there, and we want to tie some strings together tight again. First guy he sits down with is the Shah of Iran, who was a total gangster. He and the Shah of Iran put a bank together. They lent money to Hitler. Hitler came back with the same money, and they put a guy named Khashoggi's family involved, and they bought arms. Now, America wasn't in the war yet, so Joe Kennedy didn't think he was doing anything wrong. But England turned around and said, hey, Sunshine, you are aiding our enemy. And they threw him out of England. Nobody ever said why he was thrown out. They said that, well, he just uh, he was he was against our our manner of democracy and all this other stuff, blah, 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 some bullshit political reason for throwing him out of the country. And it was never reported in the country because when he came home, because there was no television, radio st stations were controlled, Murchison family owned most of them, the Gore family owned the newspapers on the East Coast, and, and the Hearst owned them on the West Coast, and Joe Kennedy was, was friendly with both of them. So nothing was ever printed derogatory. He came home as Ambassador Joe Kennedy. Do you hear what I said? Yes. No, nobody ever said a word. But do you think he didn't anger a lot of people? Believe me. People don't, people, people don't look at what the reality of life is or what really happened in the history of our own country. The, the crash of 29, how did it happen? Do you know why it happened? Or do you read a lot of media stories that tell you this and tell you that? And I can give you a very clear-cut answer as to why the crash happened. Okay. Please. Joseph Kennedy was a brilliant banker. Very, very clever banker. But he was controlled by the Hamilton Club in Chicago. And they told him they wanted him to do something one day just to see if he could do it. So he did. They hustled 5 million shares of common stock off of Cafe Newsroom in broad daylight, and no one ever caught it. And they said, boy, that's pretty good. Now, here's what we really want you to do. Because America had become a war-bearing country after, number, after World War I. And we started making war surplus, and we were taking jobs away from Europe, and we were not... Europe was pro protesting that we were not giving them fair amount of money return on the money they invested in the country because that's where the money came from to build America, through the Bank of England, from the bankers in Geneva. Okay. So they turned around and they said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to do a short sell. And we want it aimed at 30 companies, all European. One of the companies being a company that Black Jack Bovier, Jackie Kennedy's father, and his uncle and his, and, and, and his cousin were involved with, and it was a Rothschild company. And they bankrupt them all. The short sell bankrupt all of them. 
and the short sell worked very well. First week worked good. They took a couple days off. They were coming back to finish it up. And when they took the couple days off, the country panicked. And the crash happened. They ran on the banks. They didn't do it to, 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 to make that happen. It just was a remnant of what was going on. Okay? So when he got done doing that, Roosevelt said, you did a great job, kid. Here's what we want you to do now. We want you to head up the SEC and rewrite all the laws because they knew Europe had to reinvest back into the country. So they wanted it on their terms now. Good Blackjack Bovier, Jackie Kennedy's father, drank himself to death. She swore she would get vengeance, her mother. And she groomed her daughter to marry his son to get her money back. But in the interim, in the interim, the SEC worked out very well. Joe Kennedy did a great job again. One more time, they said, boom, now we will make you ambassador to England. That's how he advanced his career. But every time he advanced his career, it was off of somebody else's back. When the crash happened, he gained all of his properties in Florida and everywhere. He bought them for 10 cents on a dollar. Penny on a dollar, actually. He made a fortune in the, in the Depression. Whoa. Am I making any sense to you there, young man? Oh, absolutely. I, these are things that uh, predate what World War II, and I know him from what happened in World War II. And what happened in World War II? Let me tell you something even better. Before we were in the war, submarines were torpedoing ships. German submarines were torpedoing ships right off of our harbors, right off of our, our waterways. Joe Kennedy was involved with some ships. That's why Onassis hated him. He got involved with shipbuilders who were rebuilding the ships that were being blown up from the ammunition and the, and, and the support that he gave Hitler. Was this getting out to the press that we were being No. Attacked? Are you crazy? No. But it was there. Anybody who wanted to see it could see it. It was there. How come I know it? Well, you know a lot of things. I mean, they were. Just, this is where this is where where we got involved in 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 the in the fact that the information leaking out of the, out of the harbors in New York was coming from Sicilians because we weren't in the war. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They were getting a lot of money from the Germans for giving them information. And again, the War Department went to my father and he went to to Meyer Lansky and they begged for help. And Meyer Lansky said, there's only one guy that can help you, but you got him locked up in Don Moore. He's the only guy that can help you, Charles Luciano. And Charlie Luciano put an order out to a Sicilian fisherman. I want to talk to you, sunshine. And the guy made the worst mistake of his life, said Charlie Luciano. Who the hell is Charlie Luciano? Hey, the hell with you. And that guy was sitting, and this never came out in the papers either. That guy was sitting in his house in his kitchen, across the table for him, was the biggest Nazi spy in the country. And they both got whacked at the same time. Whoa. And that ended all the bullshit. And then my father blew up the boat that caused all the ruckus on the water docks. And they blamed this, they blamed that, boom, they blamed the They blamed, every blame was pushed everywhere, everywhere, and no one ever told the truth about anything. Now, these were stories that Meyer Lansky would tell you, and you'd listen. Not only him, Frank, and, and Charlie himself. Wow. Hey, uh, we have it's the same. There's no different than, It's no different than, you know, people say to me, how did Albert ever meet your mother? My father, and this, how many people even know this, Albert was a sergeant in the Army in Indian Gap, Pennsylvania, teaching soldiers how to be longshoremen when they were looking for them everywhere. After Lefke got cut, they, they were, Albert was there, now the only head of Murder Incorporated. They were looking everywhere for him. And he was Eleven shy. guys were indicted. What? He was right under their, their noses. He was, in, he was in the Army. And he, he wasn't even a citizen. 
They didn't make him a citizen until he came out of the army. That, but he was in the army. And, and I'll tell you even something better than that. There was a guy, a New York writer from one of the newspapers, called up. <laughs> he got, or the police in New York got a phone call from a captain at the army base where Albert was. And the guy said to the, the police, he said, hey, this, this Albert Anastasia guy you guys are looking for. And they said, who? Albert Anastasia. I'm looking at the newspapers. his front page of all your New York papers and all. And you're looking for him everywhere. I got him right here in my army. I said, what are you talking about? He said, this Albert Anastasia guy, he's right here in my army. He said, hold on a second. The guy came back on the line. He said, oh, that's bull. We're not looking for Albert Anastasia. That's all newspaper chunk. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So you can't, you can't, see, you can tell me a lot of things if you read it from a book or it was over here, but I live this stuff. You can't tell me what I know. I think there's a big coincidence with you being his son that the reason you've lived a blessed life. Well, it didn't hurt. Didn't hurt. <laughs> it didn't hurt, you know. that's for sure. You know? All right. Hey, keep but these people are smart you're... people. Um, smart people is what it's about. And um, like I say, you've made reference to the fact that your dad was smart, that Maya Lansky was smart, and I know about you being smart. So um, you're a great guest. I love having you. I love chat. Love chatting with you. And you had yeah, Miss Coffee when you were talk I'll tell you what, you were talking about your dealings with bicycle cards and the Russians. I mean, I'm sitting here, you're um you're very convincing. Let me tell you something. Um you're in my backyard, sweetheart. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Keep coming back. And stay healthy. Have a good day, my boy. All right. Jack O'Hallorhan, son of Albert Anastasia, and a Renaissance man in his own right. I'm Ralph Zig Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio. And I just want to implore you all, um, I rarely get to do this anymore, keep your dreams wet. Keep your humor dry, and keep your kids off the laps of clerics wearing dresses, and everything will work out better. <laughs> Adios, everybody. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening. <laughs>